Welcome to module 58 of Point Set Topology, part 1. We continue our study of topological groups. In the last module, we have already noticed that the topology of a topological group is regular. This we actually proved while proving even a stronger separability property for topological groups. Several authors are not satisfied with this much. In fact, <clears throat> there are two schools of, you know, mathematicians, or we may say only topologists. One we sticks to Hausdorff's, the other one sticking to regularity. <laughs> so the Hausdorff uh, people, especially the the Bourbaki oriented people, they would like to have every topological space housed off. So, right in the beginning, they put this hypothesis a housed off space with a continuum, with a multiplication, blah, blah, blah. So, we have not put that one. So, let us see how you can guarantee housed offness with minimal assumption. Okay, so we have already noticed that the moment it is T naught, it will be a one. moment it is T1, it will be housed off T2, right? So now we would like to show that the T naughtness is just enough. Okay, since a diagonal map G cross, no, continuous map. G comma H going to G cross uh, G H inverse. Inverse image of the singleton set is the diagonal in G cross G. So if singleton set is open, uh, closed, diagonal will be closed, so it will be masked off. That is that is clear. So T one ness is enough, but even T one ness will be guaranteed by T naught ness. That is the first thing that we want to ensure today. Okay. So let G be a topological group with its topology satisfying T naught axiom. Automatically it will be T3. All that we want to show is that it is T1. Then we have just now we have observed T1 implies actually T2, but even that is not necessary because we have already proved it's regular. Regular plus T1 is T3. T3 implies T2 implies T everything else, right? So, so let us just prove that it is T1. Okay. So, what is the meaning of T0? T0 means given two distinct points, you may be able to find an open set around one of them, not containing the other. But which one, which will, which it will contain, you don't know. That is the point. Whereas, if you can sh be do sure that you can do it for both the points, that is T1. But in the case of a topological group, you don't have to worry about all the points. You should just show that singleton E is closed. Then because of the translation homeomorphisms are there, all other points will be also closed. Okay, this we have observed earlier. So all that we want to show that now is G minus E is open. Okay. What does that mean? For each point G not equal to E, we must find a neighborhood UG which does not contain E. So that's all we have to do. The only problem is for some G we may find UG which contains G but not E, but so for some others it may be, it may contain E but not UG, but, but not G. Okay. If for all G you can find a UG, 
all g means what? All g inside g minus e, not equal to e. If we can find a open set U G, which does not contain E, then we are done. So consider those G such that U G contains E and not G. All right. For such G, what you do? Put V G equal to U G intersection U G inverse. See, now just now I assumed that U G contains E. Identity element. So G inverse of U G inverse U inverse of that will also contain G, right? Symmetry U inverse is just under image under symmetry, right? Inverting all the elements. So E will be there on both of them. So E will be here. So V G will be a neighborhood of E, right? So V G is a neighborhood of E, and it won't contain G inverse, right? If it is G inverse is here, then G will be here and vice versa. So, so G is not here. So this is smaller than U G and this one. So it will not contain G inverse either. So first it didn't contain G, but now it doesn't contain G inverse because it's the intersection of both of them. Therefore, G of V is a neighborhood of G which does not contain E because if this G V contains E would mean that there is a G inverse inside V. G into G inverse is the only way you can get E, right? So that is not possible. So v, G of V does not contain E. So we have got a neighborhood of the first kind, namely this. Now this V will be inside G. Okay. So that is the trick here. Just T naught implies T one, and therefore T three. Now you may suspect that every topological group actually satisfies T naught axiom also. After all, you wanted to do it minimally. That may be the reason why so many good authors are assuming. Let us assume for the Hausdorff and so on. But that is not the case. And there are a big area of mathematics wherein you know topological groups are used. Those topological groups. Are not T not. In particular, I am giving you one example here. I can't deal with all those examples. So, especially useful in algebra. Okay. Now my point is that there are such more general group, you know, topological groups, interesting ones. So that is why we should keep this general definition. So here is the example. If you don't know. Any ring theory and so on. This is a very elementary definition of rings and ideals I have used here. You can just believe it and leave it. Okay, I have no time to explain what is a ring, what is a commutative ring with identity, what is a proper ideal, and so on. If you know these things, then what I am going to tell is very elementary. So you can just remember that some such thing was there, and then. Go deeper into it when you come across it. Okay, so now just concentrate on what I am saying. If you don't understand some terms here, I have no time to introduce them. Let R be any commutative ring with identity, just like, just like integers. Okay, just like uh, rational number. Rational number should be field. It's just like integers, you can say. And I be a proper ideal in R. Ideals are like n times third. Okay, that's all. Then the family B, which is obtained by shifting i power n, x plus i power n, where x rings over all of R, and n is natural number. So I am taking i i square i cube and so on. Okay. There is a multiplication in the commutative ring, so I am writing i into i, i into i square, and so on. This is a standard uh, uh, notation for when its ideal is there. These things will be also ideals. Okay, look at all these x plus i power n. They will form a, actually a cover for the whole of R because I am the x plus i power n. But they will form a base for a topology. 
let us call this as kappa is kappa in uh, honor of krul is called krul topology okay so that topology it, it, i mean you have to check that it is it is a topology it is a basin and it's really topology okay under that topology addition in the ring it is a commutative group right so addition in the ring becomes a topological group so that will be continuous both addition and subtraction are continuous that is the meaning of that is a topological group and we know that if you take this in and x equal to 0 here they will form a neighborhood of neighborhood system for zero intersection of all these neighborhoods namely just in where n ranges over this one we know that it is equal to zero bar okay this is a general fact about any uh, any topological groups it follows that the krull topology is t1 because singleton 0 is closed if and only if this rhs is equal to singleton 0 so t1 is what singleton 0 must be closed so singleton 0 is closed means 0 is equal to 0 bar so 0 bar is equal to this one so this is the condition on i the ideal i should have the property that intersections of all its powers the powers you know one included the other and so on so that should become singleton zero and that is a non trivial condition this doesn't happen always in the integers you can see that it happens every non zero element okay we will have to you know some some power divides if if each each take a prime p if every power of p divides a number that number must be zero okay so in particular if you take the integers it, the, you can see that this happens okay all right that's all i want to tell you about uh, the krull uh, uh, idea krull topology there is another aspect in uh, algebraic geometry okay what are called as algebraic groups they are not actually topological groups okay you have to be careful because in the definition of algebraic group you start with an algebraic variety g with the zariski topology namely Closed subsets are those which are given by vanishing of polynomial functions, and then on G cross G, you are not taking the product topology. It is not the product of the Zariski topology with itself, but it is the Zariski topology directly on G cross G, which just means that there will be. a double number of variables and all polynomials in that has to be taken and so on so you have to be a bit careful that the the group you know topological group theory that we are developing in this uh, in this sequence of lecture you cannot apply them directly in the case of algebraic groups there may be several parallel statements okay parallel definitions etc you have to check each of them correctly properly and then only you can use them some of them are even wrong okay so any anyway, none of them you would have proved because all our proof depends upon the topology on g cross g the product topology okay so having said that one let us do something in the in our own definition not zariski topology now A subgroup H of a topological group G is called discrete. Okay, discrete subgroup. If as a subspace, it is discrete. It's already subgroup. 
there is no condition on group theory to an algebraic condition. In the topology, the subspace must be a discrete. Discrete means what? Isolated and closed. Okay, it must be a closed subgroup, it must be a closed subset, and it must be each point must be isolated. Note that a closed subgroup H of G is discrete if and only if there exists a neighborhood U of E such that H intersection U is singleton E. As soon as the singleton E is isolated, again, by using translation, you can show that all elements of H are isolated. Take any H inside H. Okay. You take the same neighborhood here, H of U intersection, little H of, little H of U intersection with H will be just a singleton H. So, so this is easy to see that once singleton E is isolated in H, H will be a discrete subgroup. Only you don't know whether H is closed, so you have to put that closeness also. So why one is interested in discrete subgroups? It is very old uh, notion, you know, classically interest in discrete subgroups arose in the study of doubly periodic functions. Okay, you can see that the exponential function is already periodic, but that did not uh, really give rise to this study of discrete groups and so on. But the same thing when you take doubly periodic functions inside complex plane, okay, there you have to start worrying about more general things and, and uh, you know, right now in C itself, R2 itself, it happens. So why many, many properties of this periodic function, okay, they can be deduced easily if you understand the discreteness of the periods. The set of periods becomes a discrete subgroup. That is how this is interesting. Since you may not know what is periodic function and so on, I will not elaborate on that one. So this much motivation is enough. Okay. <clears throat> so here is a easy lemma first of all and then we will improve upon this lemma all non trivial discrete subgroups of r are infinite cyclic typical example is integers sitting inside r okay here i am looking at r as an additive group so it is a topological group, additive topological group, right? So there Z is a subgroup which is discrete. So what this theorem says is everything is infinite cyclic. As soon as you take any non-trivial discrete subgroup, it must be infinite cyclic. The proof is very easy. Okay. It suffices to show that every non-trivial discrete subgroup is generated by one element. Okay. Obviously, in the additive group of real number, every element other than zero is of infinite order. Therefore, this is all enough. That will be that will gen the, the group generated by that one will be infinite cyclic automatic. So so what I start, I am looking for that generator. So put T equal to infimum of mod R, where R belongs to H minus zero, non-zero elements of H. Look at the one which has least uh, modulus. Okay. What I want to say, there are exactly two of them. You can check whether plus one and minus, plus and minus, minus of that will be also there because H is an additive subgroup, right? So, look at the infimum of mod R. Obviously, this is bounded below, so infimum is well defined, but this is a discrete group. 
okay so it's a discrete set of points inside r right so this infimum is a closed also h minus 0 is closed so this infimum will belong to h minus 0 therefore this t is positive and belongs to h that means what g if i take 0 less than t t itself is inside h you may say mod t okay mod t is inside t or plus minus t is inside right and you take change the sign it will be also inside it. so having found an element like this claim is that t generates h okay so for this all that you have to use is a division algorithm okay t 2t 3t 4t they are there and you want to show that well minus t my, 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 minus 2t they are also there but nothing else that's what you want to show right so all of h is like that so you divide by t okay any r can be divided n t plus s where s where n is some integer plus or minus but s will be strictly less than t you can always choose s to be positive non negative okay if you start with r inside h t is already inside h so nt is inside h r minus nt which is s that will be also inside h but mod s is less than t how can that be so the only way it can happen is this s must be 0 not h minus 0 not in h minus 0 S is 0 means R is n times t, where n is an integer. Therefore, H is generated by t. Okay. Now, without much effort, the same idea can be generalized to any Rn. Only thing is, you have to use now more linear algebra not just uh, real numbers but linear algebra will have to use okay not very deeper very elementary linear algebra only so let us see how so statement is this one now let v be a real vector space of dimension n every non-trivial discrete subgroup of v is isomorphic to z power m for some m less than or equal to n. Okay. <clears throat> non trivial, I assume. So one is less than or equal to m less than or If n is one, we have already proved it in the previous lemma. So the idea is to use induction okay induction and some linear algebra let us assume this n is bigger than 1 and the statement is true for all vector spaces of dimension less than n take the linear span v prime of h inside v h is a subset of v so you can take the linear span that is some vector space so vector subspace of v if v prime is a is the whole of v then by induction we are through it's sorry if v prime is not the whole of v the subspace okay then in this subspace has dimension less than n so h is sitting there right it is a discrete subset inside V itself, so it will be discrete here also. Okay, so you can apply the induction. So, so without loss of generality, we can assume that we are inside V prime equal to V. That is the case. What is that meaning? Uh, that the set of vectors H. They form a generating set for V. Any generating set will admit a 
subset which is linearly independent maximal that means a basis at least this is true very easily for a finite dimension vector space right so that is one linear algebra i'm using it now okay it follows that there is a r basis a contained inside h okay for the space v what is v v is v prime it is with the span of h all right so i could have made an elaborate statement in the in the theorem itself but even this step will be used useful to you so you should remember the proof here rather than just the final statement now let us go ahead now the uh, idea is same as dimension one case what you do put t equal to infimum of norm h now not just mod h okay where h runs over h minus zero once again h is discrete so h minus zero is also discrete closed and all that therefore this t will be positive okay and there is at least one element h1 belonging to h so the namely infimum is attained let's say what thing h belong to h is that this t is equal to norm of h1 okay you can now replace one of the elements of a by h1 okay and assume that a is h1 union some other finite set which is a basis for v you can trade how do you do that remember write this h1 as something alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus alpha n vn one of the alpha is must be non zero so let us alpha 1 then instead of v1 you can put this uh, uh, h1 and keep other v2 v3 vn as it is that will be also basis so this is trading this thing is also part of linear algebra which is used to prove that any two basis have same number of elements right i am just recalling you some the linear algebra that saw so it follows that see one element as they are all elements of, remember they are all elements of h itself but now i have put uh we started with a basis which is uh, consisting of elements of h now i have put this h1 which has what what's the property norm of h is minimal there may be many elements i have taken one of them and assuming that this is one of the generators okay now i just split up the whole thing put v1 equal to r times a1 the the linear span of the rest of them h1 equal to h intersection v1 so i am taking a subspace which is one dimension lower okay and then i am taking h1 h intersection v1 h is discrete inside v h1 will be discrete inside v1 okay so what you have is v is written as some copy of r spanned by h1 direct sum with v1 and h will be the infinite cyclic subgroup generated by this h1 inside r so that is the lemma 1 direct sum with h1 this is a discrete group and this is the copy of z that's also discrete of course so you, you get the direct sum decomposition like this because there is a direct sum decomposition of the whole vector space also one checks that h1 is a discrete subgroup of v1 because it's intersection of h with v1 so by induction because the dimension has dropped down here h1 must be a isomorphic to some zk for some k less than equal to n minus 1 add this one more 
component h1 what does it give you h is isomorphic to k plus 1 but that is question could end anyway okay so this is just a small beginning of the study of discrete subgroups this is a large subject you know there are books written on uh, it titled discrete subgroups of lead groups okay let us go ahead with the study of the subgroups take h to be a closed subgroup of g okay then the right cosets the right cosets similarly left cosets also you can take given the quotient topology because they are the orbits of the action of h on g right cosets are what they are they are the orbits of the action left cosets the right cosets depending upon which action you take is given by that is given the quotient topology because it is a quotient set okay and this is called a homogeneous space okay what is the meaning of homogeneous space you start a topological group take a closed subgroup then look at g by h there is a closeness is uh, something as a mighty assumption here because non closed subgroups are extremely badly behaved you can always take g by h where h is also not closed but you can't do much uh, topology on that one okay so i am using this notation g by h for right cosets this this also i will re re read as g by h only but i don't know how to read it this is very popular in uh, in lie group theories and so on so it is a left coset both both of them they have to use that's why they have cooked up this notation observe that g acts on the left of g by h on the right on the right cosets it acts on the left okay this is the reason for the name homogeneous because action is transitive what does it mean of transitive given any two any two cosets here there is an element of g so say g of that is the other coset so one point is taken to the other point any two points are related by the action or the orbit space of this by this action will be just one single element so that is the meaning of transitivity okay such actions when you have such actions on a space that space is called homogeneous okay that is the reason for homogeneity so what is the uh, what is the good point of homogeneous spaces all local properties topological properties if they hold at one single point they will hold at all other points just like topological groups have that property the homogeneous spaces will also have that property so here is a uh, an example here which we have just discussed already right consider the consider the case when h is non trivial discrete subgroup of n dimensional vector space over the reals as in just now we have considered okay in the proof of this that theorem as well as the previous lemma we have seen that the discrete subgroup h is generated by linearly independent elements u1 v2 vm where m is less than or equal to n right extend this r basis extend this to an r basis v1 v2 vm add some more to get a entire basis for the vector space v okay take e1 e2 en as standard basis for rn now what i am doing 
I'm going to map E1 to V1, etc., EN to VM to get a isomorphism from Rn to V. Okay, because they have the same number of elements after all. Map EI to VI, I less than equal to 1 to N, to get an isomorphism phi from Rn to V. But this will have the property that if you take the subgroup generated by EI, that is z power n. See what are these? 1 comma 0, 0, 0, 0 comma 1 and so on, right? The lattice points will come. So they are they will generate z power n, the, the direct sum of z with n times, the z with z itself n times. Let us call it as h. Okay, no, sorry. Phi of Zn will be H automatically because they will be they will be mapped to Vi. So so H will be generated by Vi. That is the assumption. Okay. So here we are denoting the subgroup of Rn generated by E1 to En by Z power n. So that is H. Consequently, what you will get is gamma T n this notation S1 cross S1 cross S1 isomorphic to V by H. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot to tell you that. Suppose M is equal to N, then only this will be true. Okay, suppose M is equal to N, then phi of Zn will be the whole of H because that is the subgroup generated by all the V1, V2, V1, V2, Vn because M is equal to N. Then Tn is nothing but S1 cross S1 cross S1, which is V by H. Okay, V by H is this one, but how do you get this one? This is because this is Rn by Zn. Rn by Zn is isomorphic to R by Z, R by Z, R by Z n times. R by Z, you know, is isomorphic to S1. E going to uh, T going to E power 2 pi i t, giving you the uh, isomorphism R by Z to S1. Okay. So, you know, all these, these are called tori. You know, each of them is called torus. S1 cross S1 is a standard torus in dimension 2. The same name is used in higher dimension also. These are tori. They are all what? Take any finite dimensional vector space take some largest kind of discrete subgroup sitting inside that and that is a quotient. If you change a subgroup, the topology does not change, but lot of geometry will change here. So that is why they are very, very interesting these, okay. So these groups are very interesting. Even in the case of S1 cross S1, just n equal to 2, they are called elliptic curves. Why? Because each group here, how it is sitting inside R cross R, will tell you a different story, different uh, complex analysis is there. The complex analytically, they will be different. So complex structure will be different. So each of them is a called a, you know, elliptic curve. In the general case, when m is less than n, what happens? V by h will be t power m cross the rest of r n minus m. So you can uh, do the direct, you know, all this with, we could have seen this one in the proof of our theorem itself. Up to m, you have a basis, you have extended it. The extended part is r n minus m. So here it is already a, a, a quotient. V by H is T power M. Okay, V1 by H is T power M, where V1 is corresponds to the linear span of the first n ele m elements, V1, V2, Vm. Okay, so this is a general picture. So, so I have told you the complete general picture of any discrete subgroup of what? of a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, now here is some 
exercise which you can do easily arbitrary product of double i group is a double i group all right then some more exercises are there which are not all that easy but if you keep solving them one by one then it's okay in fact this one the last third one here we have seen it in a different context so this won't be difficult for you at all okay and then comes the connectivity assumptions here you may have to spend little more time but you know again try to solve them in that order so slowly then you will get uh, or you can solve all of them that is the whole idea okay and then you can apply them to various different cases also namely finally you can apply them to study these classical groups son son plus 1 and so on so there are some nice things here which is happening so i have tried to motivate these example you know by giving those elementary exercises so that you can solve these things easily so finally the, these examples are the motivating exam motivating examples for those exercises okay so best of luck you can try to do this one next time we will continue the study of topological vector spaces now okay so that will be the last topic for this course thank you